Well, a very warm welcome to each and every one of you here today. It is good to be in God's house once again to praise and to worship Him. And what a beautiful day God has given to us, the start of, uh, of a gorgeous week to come, uh, not only in terms of weather, but in terms of God's uh, plan for His people, God providing for His people. And as we gather today, we celebrate that as we begin another week together in His presence if you're visiting with us today, a very special welcome to you as well. We're so glad that you're here, and we trust that you'll be blessed uh, along with us as we gather in God's house today. As we enter into this time together uh, of worship, I'd like to read just uh, the first verse of Psalm 149, where the psalmist declares, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, His praise in the assembly of the godly. So we want to sing together. Let's stand and sing. We're going to sing, praise the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Congregation, our great God greets us this morning with these words, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, amen. Well, that song we just sang encouraged us to sing our hallelujahs. We're going to do that right now. We're going to sing a song called Hallelujah for the Cross. I think it's new for us. But if you listen to Christian radio, I am sure that you've heard this song, and maybe you've thought, hey, I want to sing that in church. Well, now's our, our chance, now's our opportunity. The praise team's going to lead us in that song. Just join in as you feel comfortable. It's, it's really catchy. We're going to get it. So let's sing this song together. Thank you. 
pray with me. God, we are so thankful for the opportunity to gather here today and to sing our praises to you and to shout hallelujah. Father, for say, to say for all the world to hear that you are the God who saves, and that you have saved us through the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary that through him and by your grace we know you and we know forgiveness and we know salvation and we know that sure and certain hope of spending eternity with you even into the new heavens and the new earth and this is not of us this is of you so father we're here today to proclaim that loudly and clearly and to celebrate you and to lift up your name and to exalt Jesus the one and only Savior, and to do that in the way that you desire and in the way that you deserve, in spirit and in truth. So bless us today, and may this time be a wonderful blessing to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Well, friends, as God's forgiven people, in the name and for the sake of Jesus, we want to be reminded again of how it is he calls us to live in this world that he has given to us and right even in our own communities where he has placed us. And so we're going to have a responsive reading of the law today. It's uh, from the Psalms. And uh, you're going to see those words on the screen behind me. I'll be reading the words in white. And if together you would respond with the words there in yellow. So let's join in this together. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You, 
You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. Amen. It's very encouraging, isn't it? Uh, that last little bit that I read for us, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth, that he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries, and he saves them. Our God is a God of salvation, that salvation that he has made particularly known to us who have been called by him in Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. And that's why we ended by saying, Praise the Lord. And that's why our entire lives should be made up of praising God. Whatever we do, whatever we say, whatever we think, that it would bring praise to the God who saved us. We want to go to this God in prayer together this morning, and as we do, just a couple of of things uh, to point out for us. Uh, First of all, a couple of prayer items. If we would continue to be in prayer for Christy Mottman, uh, Wesson, Marilyn Hook's daughter, she's completed a month, 30 days of therapy, and just really pray that those uh, sessions would have been very helpful for her uh, going forward. Then also just got a call from, uh, from Kathy Skolton this morning. We've been praying for her brother, Mark Strabbing, and uh, Mark was battling cancer, and uh, finally he has uh, he's succumbed to that, and he passed away yesterday, and Kathy wanted us to know Uh, certainly to be in prayer for uh, his family and for her and her family and all of those uh, who will mourn Mark's uh, passing. Uh, Obviously, no arrangements have been made at this time, but I'm sure that you can uh, go online and find that or uh, watch the paper, and you can find out more information about that. If we get that, we'll try and pass that on as well. Then also, uh, in your announcements today, uh, just to highlight this, if you haven't read that yet, there's an announcement uh, regarding uh, Kurt Ritzma's uh, position here at church. Uh, as many of you know, for many years, he's been kind of a part-time uh, youth leader, and his position has now been expanded uh, into uh, full-time. And we're very excited about that. As uh, many of you know, that youth group has been, has been growing steadily through the years. And uh, so this new position will allow him to devote more time uh, to that youth ministry as well as Uh, a little bit of uh, another ministry position that we're calling Connections Pastor. And in uh, about a quarter of his time then, uh, we'll be given over to uh, connecting with uh, new members of this congregation and existing members alike uh, in order to help us connect with each other, to connect with the ministry here at Grafskopf, to come to know and understand our giftedness and to be able to plug that in. Uh, to the various needs that we have around here as a church. So we're really excited about that. Kurt's really excited about that. Uh, In a couple of weeks, he's going to say a little bit more about that uh, to us. Uh, But I wanted all of us to be well aware uh, of that, just to point out that announcement there and to pray for Kurt uh, as he begins this new position starting September 1. So let's go to God in our prayer together. Well, Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, uh, Lord, we give you praise, we give you thanks, and we honor you. We exalt you as the God of glory and the God of grace. And God, we are so very thankful for the salvation that you have given to us in Jesus. Even as we sang together just a moment ago our songs of praise and our, our opportunity to shout hallelujah and to say that it is our God who saves We know that salvation only comes from you, and only in the name and for the sake of Jesus. That is only through him that we find the forgiveness of our sins. That is only through him that we have that promise of eternal life. And Father, we know this is the greatest gift that you could ever give to us. And we are so very thankful. 
And Father, we've had the opportunity to listen again to your will for our lives and to be reminded how, as your people, as those who've been called by you and touched by your grace, that how it is you want us to live in this world around us. And that, Father, as we look at your word and as we consider your will and we hear Jesus' summary of that saying, love God above everything else with all that you are, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. God, that you would see to it, that you would work through us to be able to, to follow that will, to seek your way, to always look to you, and Lord, to be your ambassadors even in the places where you have put us. And Lord, that for your name's honor and glory. Father, you've given us so many blessings, and we want to take a moment this morning once again to acknowledge that. And certainly the spiritual blessings that you've given to us in Christ, but so much else as we look around us, even in a time of, uh, that's difficult, uh, challenging situations all around us, you have blessed us richly. Father, for so many, we're so grateful for the health and strength that you've given to us. We're grateful for those material blessings that we have, for the jobs that we can go to, for the families that you have given to us, for the many other relationships that we enjoy, for this church family, and even the opportunity to come together and worship, although it's maybe not exactly what we, what we would want it to be right now, but nevertheless, to be able to join together on Sundays, to gather, to to sing and to pray and to, to dig into your word and to go from this place being encouraged to live for you. Father, all of these are blessings from your hand. And we acknowledge that again today. We give you thanks and we give you praise. We want to thank you in a special way for Kurt and for the work that he's been doing through the years here. And now pray for him especially in his expanded position and Pray, Lord, that that would be a blessing to so many of our, our kids and our young people. And Father, as he seeks to, uh, to help connect us more and more to each other and more and more to the ministry here at Grafscup, Father, we ask a blessing in that work that he will do, and that it would encourage him and that it would encourage us as well. We pray for those who have special needs today. We think of those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We think of Kathy and Mark Strabing's family and, and his loss. And Father, we pray that you would give comfort and that you would give peace. And Father, we pray that uh, you would surround them with your presence and that they might be able to feel your concern and love for them at this time. And for those who are recovering from surgery, we think of Jen Veal and Marsha Veltman, too, and very grateful for your healing touch in their lives. And pray for that to continue, and Father, that uh, very soon they would, they would feel much, much better, even back to normal. We think of others with special needs like Mark Brooker and, and Russ Johnson and Alice Genzink, and Lord, there are so many others who who need you in ways that for many of us, who perhaps we don't know specifically. But Father, we're glad to know that you know each one of us better than we know ourselves. You know what we need even before we ask it. And that God, as we look to you, you will supply every need that we have. We pray for other loved ones in our lives. Think of Linda Weemhoff once again, and the resurgence of the cancer that she's dealing with, and Christy Mottman as well. We're grateful uh, for the sessions that she's gone through, and we do pray that they would be very effective. We think of Bobby Brennan, too, and his continuing need for a kidney, and we just ask that you would provide. Father, we think, too, of the many needs and concerns in, in the world around us. We hear of fires that are raging in Colorado and California as well, and Pray for those who are fighting those fires and that you would protect them and help them to control those fires. We think of leaders uh, all over, whether it's leaders right here in our church or those in our community, the leaders of our state, our nation, even across the world, and the very challenging decisions that they make from day to day. And Father, we pray that 
that through them you would work powerfully, that they would be willing for that, and that, Lord, you would, that you would continue to lead and to guide. And even in the midst of a pandemic uh, across the globe and, and even in the midst of the other challenges that we're experiencing in our nation today. Father, for all of these many things, and for so many more that we haven't voiced particularly, but they reside in our hearts. And Father, in the life of our congregation and around us in our community and world, we lift these to you. And we do so with gratitude in our hearts for your invitation to come to you and to lay our burdens at your feet and to know that, that you're strong enough to deal with them and you, you care enough for us. You love us enough to want to take them. And so, Father, we thank you. We pray a continued blessing as we, as we worship today. As we look into your word in just a moment, as we continue to learn at lessons for living, that, Lord, you would open our, our minds and our hearts and that we would go from this place encouraged even more to live for you. We ask this in Jesus' name and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Well, as we prepare to uh, listen to God's word this morning, we're going to sing. And the song is called Cornerstone. Would you stand as we sing together? <laughs>
I'd like to invite you, if you brought your Bibles with you today, to go ahead and turn in them uh, to the book of Esther. Esther chapter 4 is going to be our text for today, and we'll get to that uh, in just uh, a few moments. But again, if you've got a Bible, it'd be great to go ahead and open them up, turn there, and uh, you'll be ready to go. Well, congregation, today we, uh, we're just continuing uh, in a series that we began, uh, oh, a couple months ago now, really uh, takes us back to... Uh, Uh, Mid-June or so, right after we restarted our corporate worship gatherings after about three months of of YouTube worship, and it's a series really in which we're taking a look at a variety of familiar Old Testament characters and then learning some very important lessons for living, some key qualities, as we're calling them, uh, qualities that God wants to see cultivated Uh, in our hearts and lives, in the hearts and lives of those who belong to him. Now, so far along those lines, we've had the opportunity to look at seven of those uh, Old Testament characters. And if you've uh, been paying attention, then you know that every character we've looked at so far has been a male, right? They've all been men. So we've talked about Noah and Abraham Joseph and Moses, Joshua, David, and Elijah. But obviously, as we know, as we read our Old Testaments, we know there's uh, more famous uh, characters than just men. There are female uh, characters as well that are really worth uh, our time to invest in. And so we want to do that. We want to do that today. Uh, We're going to look at one character particularly Uh, And uh, she's not going to be the only female character we're going to look at uh, just a couple of weeks as we close this series off. We're going to look at another uh, familiar female character. But today we want to take a closer look at a woman by the name of Esther. And we want to learn together today a lesson on courage. And this is a quality uh, that God most certainly wants to see in the hearts and lives of his people today. Godly courage. And I want us to understand right from the start what we're talking about here. When we talk about courage in this connection, godly courage, we are talking about a willingness to do what God is calling us to do for him regardless of the risks. That's how we're We're defining this term courage today in terms of the biblical example. This is a godly courage. So it's not a a worldly courage per se, right? There's a difference. There's a difference between worldly courage and godly courage. Worldly courage uh, in our minds typically has something to do with some heroic effort, right? Or, Or maybe just in some way conquering fear, right? So maybe we're talking about storming the beaches at Normandy, Or maybe we're just simply talking about, you know, the ability to jump out of a perfectly good airplane with a parachute on our back. Right, courage, that's that's more of a worldly courage. But we're talking today about a godly courage, right? This willingness to do what God is calling us to do for him, regardless of the risks. That's what we're talking about. So before we really get into our text for today... I want to give all of us a little background on Esther and her situation. So most biblical scholars place Esther in or around the middle of the 5th century B.C., which we need to know is the post-exilic period of the nation of Israel. Post-exilic simply meaning after the exile. In other words, after 536 B.C., when the Persian Empire conquered the Babylonian Empire, which effectively ended Israel's exile. So this is the the period of history we're talking about for God's people. And during this time, specifically 486 to 465 BC, a man by the name of Xerxes was the king of Persia. And as the opening chapter of the book of Esther lays out for us, Xerxes 
was in need of a new queen. So his former queen, a woman by the name of Vashti, had apparently angered the king, and so, so he gotten rid of her. He, he deposed Vashti as, as queen. Now King Xerxes was looking for a new queen. And so in the process of that search, he discovered a woman by the name of Esther. Esther really caught his attention. Esther caught his eye. And so Xerxes determined that Esther was going to be his new queen. Now Esther was a Jew. But as chapter 2 makes very clear for us, she had kept her, her family background and her nationality a secret. No one knew except for one person, and that was her uncle, a man by the name of Mordecai. Well, as chapter 3 goes on to tell us, one day Mordecai, who also of course was a Jew, offended Haman, who happened to be King Xerxes' right-hand man. And in response, the hot-headed Haman decided not simply to deal harshly with Mordecai, but in fact to deal harshly with the entire Jewish population of the Persian Empire. And so he goes to the king and he asks for the king's permission to kill all the Jews. And almost without thought, Xerxes gives him the green light. So that's where we pick up the story in chapter 4. So let's turn our attention there. I'm going to read the whole chapter, verses 1 through 17. Here is God's word to his people today. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. In every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and commanded her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. As far as we're going to read in God's word this morning, may he bless his word to us today. Now, obviously, that's not the end of the story. 
All right, chapter 4 isn't the end of the book of Esther there. There's lots more to this story. And it really is a, a wonderful story. It's filled with, with suspense. It's filled with irony. And those of you who know that story well, you know what I'm talking about. In fact, I would say if you don't know the story of Esther, if this is, if this is coming to you out of the blue, so to speak, then I would just invite you to take about a half an hour today and read through the book of Esther and I guarantee, I guarantee that you will love this story. And for those of you who don't know it especially, I'm not going to give away the end of the story. You'll have to read it to find out for yourself. But the end of the story and how the story concludes is not really our primary concern today. Because remember, we are looking particularly at Esther to learn this lesson on godly courage. And from what our text tells us here, Esther was a person who was certainly willing to do what God was calling her to do for him, regardless of any risk to her personal well-being. Because as we read, she was willing, after she heard everything that was going on, she was willing to go to the king, even though she hadn't been called to do so, knowing that she could very well be killed for doing so. That's godly courage. So what does it take then to have a courage like Esther's? Well, I think as we look into our text here, three things kind of rise to the surface, three significant things, three ingredients, we might say, that need to come together so that you and I, we can be courageous Christians. So first of all, first of all in that respect, it's about living with a sense of purpose. Right, this is the, the first and really most pervasive ingredient here to becoming a, a courageous Christian. I, I, it's really like flour in a cake, right? I mean, you really cannot have anything that even closely resembles a cake without flour. Right? I mean, you could have something that resembles a cake without sugar. You could have something that resembles a cake without, without vanilla. But you can't have anything that even closely resembles a cake without flour. And likewise, you can't even have anything that closely resembles this godly courage without this understanding, this living with a sense of purpose. Now, what am I talking about that? How, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm referring to this reality that Mordecai talks about in verse 14 of our text. When he goes to Esther through this, this eunuch and, and he explains everything that's happening, everything that's going on. And then he says this, And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And essentially here Mordecai is telling Esther that God has a plan for her life. That God has a reason for her existence. That she's not just some hiccup in his creative working. That she has a part to play in the divine drama. And who knows, says Mordecai, maybe this is it. But in any event, Esther needs to know and acknowledge that she isn't just some footnote in God's redemptive work. She's not just some afterthought. She's not just some unnecessary element. That's just not the way it is, says Mordecai. That life, and very particularly when it comes to life as a believer, life is about being an instrument in the hands of God. And that this is how we need to live, with this sense of purpose permeating all that we are. Understanding that no matter who we are as a believer, God has placed us on this planet for a reason. So that he can work through us according to his will, and in line with his revealed word. And that is such an essential ingredient when it comes to the courage that we're talking about today. Living with this sense of purpose is exactly that which makes us even consider doing what God calls us to do for him in the first place. 
Because when we know and understand that we are not some cosmic accident, that God has a reason for us, he placed us here for a purpose, that he wants us to participate in his story of redemption, no matter who we are as a believer, doesn't mean you have to be a pastor, it doesn't mean you have to be a missionary, doesn't mean you have to be a Bible teacher, doesn't mean you have to work in the Christian school, but as a believer, no matter who you are, that God has a reason for placing you on this planet. That you are to be an instrument in his hands. That through you, he can work. And that you're a vital player in his story of redemption. That's what living with purpose is all about. That's that vital and pervasive ingredient of being a courageous Christian, of having that godly Courage. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. Second ingredient to becoming a courageous Christian is leaning on God's power. So after Esther comes to terms with the fact that, that God, in fact, wants to work through her, she says to Mordecai in the first half of verse 16, she says, Go. Gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And don't eat or drink for three days. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Now essentially what's happening here is that Esther was leaning on God's power. You see, she understood, she knew that in order to do what God was, was calling her to do, she could not do that in her own strength. She could not do that in her own power, that she needed God's strength. She needed to be empowered by God himself. You see, in Bible days, and I think most of us know this, when it comes to fasting, now it's true even today, it's just that fasting doesn't take place a whole lot, but in Bible times particularly, fasting was the most expressive way of humbling oneself and making it very clear to God that you were not depending on yourself. That you were, in fact, were leaning on him. You were depending on his strength for the task ahead. So that's exactly what Esther called all the Jews in Susa to do and what she herself did as well. And that's another important ingredient, right, to this, this godly courage that we're talking about here today. This honest recognition for you and I. This honest recognition that we need God. That when it comes to those things that he's calling us to do for him, we need him. We need his strength. We need his power. In fact, we need it desperately. That to understand if we try to do what God is calling us to do for him by ourselves, that it's not going to work. That he has to be the one empowering us. He has to be the one giving us the strength. If we try to do it by ourselves, then we're going to discover very, very quickly just how weak we really are. And I don't know about you, but I've tried that. I've tried it. And it doesn't work. We find out how weak we really are, just how feeble and frail we really are. So this is a second vital ingredient to godly courage, to growing this courage in our lives. It's leaning on God's power, looking to Him for the strength that He has to give us for the task ahead. And then finally, third, the third ingredient to becoming this courageous Christian it's really leaving the rest to God. Right? Saying, just as Esther says in the last half of verse 16, I'll go to the king, though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. And I think we need to read this in the right context, right? We need to understand that Esther here isn't expressing some fatalistic attitude. She's not just shrugging her shoulders and says, well, whatever will be, will be. No, it's not a fatalistic attitude she's expressing. It's a realistic one. 
It's an attitude that says, I've come to understand that God wants to work through me, that I'm part of his story of redemption. I've looked to God. I'm depending on his strength and his power. And now I'm going to leave the rest to him because God's in control. See, it's not fate we're talking about here. It's this understanding that God is in control. Right, that God's in control of this universe. That God's in control of this world and God's in control of our lives. And the sooner we come to really recognize that, then the quicker this courage is going to grow in our lives. This courage to do what God is calling us to do for him, regardless of the risks. I love this story of Esther. And Esther herself, such a wonderful example of the godly courage we're talking about here. That it's all about living with a sense of purpose and leaning on God's power and then leaving the rest in his hands. That's what it is to be truly courageous. You know, Jesus obviously is the perfect example of the courage that Esther exemplifies here. And throughout his entire life, Jesus lived with that sense of purpose. He understood that he was his father's instrument to save sinners. And he never once tried to fulfill that purpose apart from his father. In fact, Jesus consistently leaned on his father's power, especially toward the end of those three years of ministry, when the Gospels tell us that he, that he resolutely set his face toward Jerusalem, knowing that a cross awaited him there, but nonetheless pressing on, content to leave it in his father's hands. Now, I would submit to you that God is longing for his people today to be courageous, to be willing to do what it is he's calling us to do for him, regardless of the risks. Now, today, that probably won't include uh, approaching a a tyrannical king with, with the possibility of being executed. But it could very well include approaching a, a classmate or a coworker or even a, a family member with the gospel with the possibility of being rejected. Or, or approaching someone in need with the possibility of being taken advantage of. But then again, maybe someday living out this godly courage will mean a high level of risk. It certainly meant that, for example, for the 16th century reformers. I think of someone like Martin Luther, when he nailed those 95 theses on the door of the church there at Wittenberg, highlighting all the the failures he saw in the Roman Catholic Church, the church. And eventually he was excommunicated for it, which may or may not mean much to us today, but it meant a lot back in the 16th century. It certainly meant a lot to someone who's always stuck in my mind for many, many years. Her name was Cassie Bernal from Columbine High School, who back in 1999, when that high school was attacked by two of its own students, She said yes, with a gun pointed at her, when asked the question, do you believe in Jesus, knowing that if she said yes, she'd be shot. And it certainly means an awful lot 
to thousands of believers scattered throughout the world today. In countries where they do not have the freedom of religion as we experience and enjoy. And they are regularly imprisoned and tortured and even killed. Simply for claiming to be a Christian. Who knows what it might mean for you and for me. But whatever it is, God is longing for his people to be courageous. To do for him what he's calling them to do, regardless of the risk. May it be that by the power of the Spirit of Christ himself who lives within us as believers, that this godly courage would grow in our lives. That more and more we live with a sense of purpose. That more and more we lean on God's power that more and more we leave the rest in his very capable and faithful hands. For God's glory and for the goal of his coming kingdom. I'm going to lead us in a prayer right now. And I want to share with you that the prayer I'm going to share is actually the chorus of a song by Casting Crowns, simply called Courageous. Let's pray together. God, we were made to be courageous, and we're taking back the fight. We were made to be courageous, and it starts with us tonight. The only way we'll ever stand is on our knees with lifted hands. Make us courageous. Lord, make us courageous. Amen. As we close our time together today, we're going to be singing it, Be Thou My Vision. It's going to be our closing song. But right before we sing that song, God wants to give us his parting blessing. Would you please stand to receive that blessing? I want to remind you as well, on your way out, you have the opportunity to give. The offering today is for our Grafscop operating fund. Before we sing together, God gives to us his parting blessing. Receive that blessing now. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen.